So you got these from the set of Ant Man? What's up, everybody? It is your host, El Bandito, rocking solo tonight, man. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we'll try to track down Senor Boyle there before the uh, cleaning crew comes in and sweeps him up or anything. But uh, it looks like I'm going to be riding solo for the rest of the night. So thanks for tuning in and thanks for joining me here. And we are going to have a rocking good time because tonight we are talking about Ant-Man and the Wasp. That's right. They have got their feature film coming out this Friday, man, July 6th, July 5th, Thursday night. They're going to have those special sneak peeks around 6 and 9 p.m. The midnight showings, man. You know I love going and catching the early releases, but... If you're not very familiar with the Ant-Man and everything he's got going on, man, you know, we know you caught the first movie and all, but what about Hank Pym? What's he doing out there, man? Michael Douglas's character. We're going to tell you all about Ant-Man's inception, his creation, and the early uh, iterations of the comic book version of Ant-Man and all the kind of cool history that goes on with that. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Also, we've got a very special game we're going to play with you guys a little bit later tonight. It's going to be the Quantum Realm Survival Game, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to show you a bunch of really close-up photos of things, and then you have to guess what they are. You know, if you were Ant-Man size, the world would look a little different, wouldn't it? So could you survive? I don't know. Let's find out a little bit later when we play the Quantum Realm game, man. But first and foremost, I'd like to take a few minutes to thank all the awesome cats that we caught up with out at Cosography 2018 this past weekend, man. Because we we rode up to Coco, bro. We met Jake and Dave and all the guys up there, man. And we just had a rocking good time, man. So I just wanted to take a minute to give them a shout out, give them a plug and say thanks for all the awesome stuff that we got to check out up there. Now, over on our Facebook page, we went ahead and we set up a album that has all the cool cosplays that we saw up there. And we set up a playlist with all of the exciting interviews that we got up there because we did finally get to get our interview with Rick Stafford, the true Aquaman out there, who's an amazing cosplayer and he has an amazing story about why he does it. So he's up there. We got a great interview with him, man. If you're an Aquaman fan and you're not super excited about the kind of Jason Momoa direction and stuff, this guy is like the freaking comic book representation of Aquaman if you've ever seen it. So it's pretty wicked, man. You're definitely going to want to check out that interview. Also, we caught up with Jake Estrada, who we met earlier earlier this year at the Daytona Beach Comic Con, and who we hung out with during the shooting of his independent film, Bocas, man. So if you guys hadn't checked out any of that stuff, make sure to check over and check the interview on our uh, Cosography playlist because he's talking about how they've got about 54 minutes of the movie shot already and they're shooting some more scenes and they may even need some more extras. You got to go check the video and see what's up. But I have to say the awesomest, coolest, most privileged thing for me is I got to personally do an interview with Athena Finger, who's the daughter of Bill Finger, the co-creator of Batman. And there's an awesome story about how that all came to be and how that all went down. And I mean, Bob Kane himself went on record and said, this guy's responsible for 75% of Batman. So why wasn't his name on everything for the last, you know... 50 years. Well, there's an awesome documentary about it on Hulu that you can check out that features Athena and her family struggle trying to get the recognition for Bill. Um, but also, we got to talk to her about what she thinks of the Batman franchise today, what she's got going on, and how that journey's impacted her life just a little bit. So go ahead and check out our playlist for all those cool interviews and more that we took at Cosography 2018, man, because we were super stoked about it. We had a great time. Again, thanks to everybody who joined us out there, who checked out our videos man and if you guys are into cosplay even in the slightest bit you have got to go check out some of the amazing costumes that these guys had out there because they are pretty killer we only threw a couple of them up on our album that's on our facebook page but you can check out their website cosography is a pretty unique name it's pretty easy to google them up and i'm sure you can find some even cooler photos of even more people there because we couldn't catch everybody i know there was a really awesome agent carter out there and she had her military uniform and stuff and i was trying to track her down man but just you know sometimes the Fates just don't just don't don't line up, man. I felt like Captain America, man, and she was dancing without me. But either way, that's enough about cosography, man. That was an exciting event. We can't wait to get up to the Space Coast Comic Con later this year, uh, who's hosted by the same folks. 
and you can check out our last video for details on that and for other upcoming cons that are going to be super awesome. But until then, for tonight, what do you say we talk about Ant-Man and the Wasp, man? Let me fire up some, some slides here for everybody, and let's see what's rocking. All right, that's us. That's not Ant Man and the Wasp. <laughs> All right, Cosography. Big, big ups to Cosography. All right, and let's see what's going on in slide box number two. I think we got some, some Ant Man. More us. Yay. Ant Man and the Wasp, guys. Are you stoked about this? I'm super stoked, man. Now, the rumor mills of buzz with this actually being set before the events of Infinity War. So that's going to be a pretty huge tie-in towards the end of the film to see, hey, what's going to happen here? You know, is everyone going to make it out okay? Is anyone going to get, like, part of the snapping? Who knows, dude? It's going to be pretty wild. But I do like the fact that we can kind of still go to Ant-Man and the Wasp but not have to deal with the gravity of what happened in Infinity War because I know there's a lot of folks out there like Kelly Jade who's all like, oh, man, I hate everything Marvel's doing and they killed Loki and I never want to go back to see another Marvel movie. But I'm going to drag her to see Ant-Man and the Wasp and we're going to check it out and it's going to be a ton of fun. I love Charlie Diskin out there, man. He's watching from afar and he says he's cosplaying as the Vanisher tonight. So, yeah, I appreciate that, man. You wished he looked as good as the Vanisher, bro. <laughs> All right. So as far as the movie goes, man, I'm super stoked to see Evangeline Lilly really come to life as the Wasp. I mean, they teased it at the end of the first movie. Uh, so, you know, I just can't wait. She was always a very critical character. Both of them were in the Avengers and stuff like that. If you've followed some of our Countdown to Infinity War series videos that we did earlier this year, you'll see that we give a lot of credit to Ant-Man and the Wasp as being kind of the, you know, founding members of the Avengers who got left out, you know? But in that first book, not only does Ant-Man's ants play a crucial role in kind of thwarting Loki, which I know sounds crazy, but read the book, it's in there. Uh, but also the Wasp, like, comes up with the name the Avengers. So yeah, kind of pretty pretty pivotal characters when it comes to the Avengers. But what's going on kind of in their world? Let's take a look real quick at what's going on in the MCU and then we'll see how that relates to what's going on in the comics, right? So let's jump right in. All right, first up, we got Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly playing Ant-Man and the Wasp. I mean, these cats are fantastic. They're, of course, both returning to their roles, and they're going to be a super ton of fun. Paul Rudd showed up for a little bit in Civil War, and it looks like he got himself locked up, and now he's on some kind of parole. You know, so we don't know. You know, we'll find out what's shaking with the Sokovia Accords. Did he have to sign up? I'm sure he did. But I love all kind of the intrigue that they have about it in the trailer. But I especially love that both these guys are coming back to reprise their roles. Also coming back, we got Michael Douglas, man, as Hank Pym, the originator, dude. I have to say, I really love the fact that throughout all the years in comics, as we'll see a little bit later, they've had a lot of different iterations of Ant-Man. Uh, but they all started with Hank Pym. So to have a representation of him here in the film as sort of a mentor for Scott Lang, for Paul Rudd, you know, it's it's really awesome. You know, I'm glad they included the character. And to bring someone of the caliber of Michael Douglas, man, just gives it so much credibility and so much awesomeness, dude, that I'm so glad he's back and going to be hanging around and have a lot of fun. Also returning, man, we got Michael Pena as Lewis, bro. This I have to say, like one time I heard from this guy, right, and my cousin Ignacio, who he was talking to this fine ass girl at this bar, and she was like, "Yo, if there was one guy, I mean, if there was one guy, right, who was like super dope, just exactly like that dude on the Power Hour of Love, it would be Lewis, man." <laughs> you know, people joke with me all the time that they're like, "Bro, you sound just like this guy," and I'm like, "Come on, get out of here. This guy's ten thousand times better than I am." <laughs> But he's a super ton of fun. I love the dude and everything he does. I'm glad to see him coming back and having some fun. And it's one of the beautiful things about Ant-Man is it's just fun. It's a fun film. So kind of separating itself a bit from Infinity War and letting its characters have some fun I think is a great thing. So let's check out some of the people coming in uh, for the new cast uh, that they're showing for Ant-Man and the Wasp. First up, we got the incredible Lawrence Fishburne, man, coming in as Goliath, man. Now, of course, he's the Bill Foster version of Goliath, who actually didn't make it out so well in the comic book Civil War version, you know? But uh, but he's here, obviously, longtime assistant and friend to Hank Pym, and he's still around and kicking, which is good, and he shares some kind of fun stories with Ant-Man about his time 
as Goliath. So pretty cool stuff there. There should be some some more interesting things kind of coming out of the uh, the film that connect to the comic history. So I can't wait to check that out. On the villain front, we have got uh, Hannah John Kamen as Ghost, right? Now, Ghost shows up, whoa, way later in the Iron Man series of all things as a villain uh, with kind of the crazy tech backstory that she has and ends up being able to walk through walls, phase shifting through stuff, and a, a bunch of crazy. So we'll have to see how that all gets integrated into this film and how they kind of rope that origin story into what's going on in this. And I figured, you know what? Let's not even delve into the comic book version of Ghost, you know, because... Let's all take a look at what they do in this movie, and then we can maybe go back and compare some notes. But for right now, as kind of a spoiler-free sort of fun for you guys out there, I'm going to let you go enjoy the ghost movie without any precursor. You know, well, not the ghost movie, the Ant-Man, the, the ghost in the movie. You know what I'm talking about. So anyways, that's looking really cool. Fly costume, man. Really looks crisp. Really looks like the, uh, the comic book version. So very cool. Also, man, we've got Walter Goggins coming in as Sonny Birch, man. Walter Goggins is a trip, bro. He's usually a bad guy in, like, Tarantino movies and stuff. So it's really cool to see him join in the Marvel Universe. And, yeah, I'm pretty sure this guy's a bad guy. Again, it's got a little bit to do with kind of ghost story and stuff like that. So we won't get into that too much tonight. But he was worth mentioning, man. And I got to say, I can't wait to see him because he's usually a pretty dastardly guy. But he's also pretty hilarious. So I think he makes a great addition to the cast here. And last but not least, man, ooh, the rumor mill going around of Michelle Pfeiffer coming in as Janet Van Dyne, man. So this would have been the original Wasp, the one that they talked about in the first movie, stopping the missile, and then getting caught in the quantum realm, man. So again, we're going to be playing our own little quantum realm game later, and we'll see if you can survive because it's just quite possible that Janet survived. So we'll have to see how that works out in the movie this weekend. But all right, that'll about wrap it up for the movie version of Ant-Man and the Wasp. So let's check out what they've got going on in kind of the, the comic book history of the Ant-Man. As Yellow Jacket actually said in the first film, the Ant-Man, a little shrinking guy, tales to astonish. They were just things you told your kid. Well, he's absolutely right, man. When you look back all of this crazy history, right? We don't even know where to start, but we absolutely have to start in Tales to Astonish number 35, man. So let's take a look at that. All right, so here's Tales to Astonish number 35. Here's beautiful cover here, man. Just looking awesome. Love the kind of forced perspective. Look at everything here. And do you guys, do you guys see this right here? Kind of up here on this panel? Let's, let's take a look inside the jacket. What is this? Yeah, okay, that's what I thought it said on the cover. This says Return of the Ant-Man. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, my hand disappeared. Return of the Ant-Man. So how can this be the place where it all started, the beginning of the Ant-Man, but it's Return of the Ant-Man? All right, let's dig a little bit deeper here and see what we can find out. So it turns out, right, that Hank Pym was featured in a comic long before the Ant-Man was, right? So often referred to as Henry and then Hank for short. Uh, Pym is, of course, the character played by Michael Douglas in the MCU films, but he's also the original Ant-Man. So we can see him here in this Tales to Astonish issue number 27, where he first uses his what he calls a potion, right, that we later call Pym particles, right? He uses a potion that he pours on himself to shrink down real small and kind of invade this sort of, you know, well, go on a miniature adventure. Let's call it that as we kind of walk through the story. Let's see what happens. All right. So first up, of course, Ant-Man, Hank Pym. This story of the Ant-Man, Hank Pym, was told and created by Stan Lee, and the script was kind of written out by his brother, Larry, Larry Lieber, right? So the two of them worked on a lot of these early books together, so that's great to see them kind of doing their thing. You know, it's, it's cool to have some, uh, you know, someone like your brother writing stories with you. I mean, that's got to be a gas, right? So both of them are credited with having part of creating uh, Henry Pym and the Ant-Man. Uh, but also, 
Jack King Kirby, baby. You know, he's in there doing those great force perspective shots, like I was saying. Here, like the one I showed earlier is a cleaned up version of it, but this is like the original cover, like someone still had. So I thought this was a really cool shot. You could see some of the original colors. But yeah, great kind of force perspective on there. You know, you see everything kind of from Ant Man's point of view, which is which is neat, you know, because you get that view of the giant world and uh, you know the kind of heroics, the mask and everything that's all right there in that first issue. And that tales do astonish 35. So what, like, does he dawn that in 27? I don't know. Let's take a look. All right. So it starts off, like I said, where he's got himself a potion, right? That can shrink anything, right? He pours it on this chair. And moments later, he pours another potion on it that returns it to its normal size. Now, it doesn't make things any larger than they normally are. It just shrinks them and returns them back to normal size. So after trying the, por the potion on himself, of course, Pym starts wandering around and checking stuff out. Got some great art here by Jack Kirby. Look at the cool little wub, 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 wub. I mean, you can just make up some sound effect in your head when you see something cool like that, you know? <laughs> but here we've got Hank shrinking down for the first time. And I love some of the dialogue in there where he says, like, I can feel myself shrinking. It's, it's pretty cool. So he shrinks down and he starts, you know, jumping around his house. He's doing all sorts of cool stuff. He's having a good time. And he accidentally kind of jumps off his, uh, you know, the porch there without thinking, dude, I can't get back up here. Like, I'm too tiny. So now he's like, oh, crap, I'm stuck out in the it kind of in the in the backyard here. And he's kind of roaming around for a little bit, and he realizes, oh, man, there's, like, this huge ant pile, like, right close by the house. I got to be kind of careful. And, of course, before you know it, he gets sucked into an adventure where these ants are chasing him. Things are going wrong. Things are kind of scary for him. And he's just definitely not having a good time. This original story really wasn't a superhero story. Uh, Tales to Astonish number 27 really read like a horror story, man. <laughs> And some of the uh, the pages in here downright mirror that. I mean, here he is getting caught up in kind of the little vices of an ant there. And what's cool about it is I love that he's like, dude, I know judo. So he's like judoing an ant right there. And you're like, that's so 60s, man. You know, <laughs> like everybody do judo chop. Huh. And uh, and he took this ant out. So so there you go. But <laughs> But he gets a little too close to this ant hill, and he realizes these ants are trying to kill him and stuff like that. He starts judoing them all up, but he manages to befriend one ant who helps him out, and he rides up the side of the, uh, the building there so that he can get to his serum, crawl inside the test tube, and then return to normal size. So again, kind of a happy end to a very harrowing adventure in which Hank decides, hey, Dude, I'm just going to pour out these freaking uh, potions. I don't want nothing to do with them. I'm going to destroy them. This stuff is crazy. I could have got myself killed. And that's kind of the end of the adventure. Now, this adventure was one of three in that original Tales to Astonish number 27. The others including like some really cool tales about uh, one of them's an alien who's stuck on an alien planet and you know just neat stuff like that. And that's what these anthology books were all about. They were about um, they were about uh, you know, combining different weird little stories into an anthology so that a reader could pick it up and get a little bit of taste of different things. The other interesting thing is if you ever get your hands on some reprints that are really true to the original books, you'll find that a lot of these had a written story in between certain pages. So it would be totally unconnected to what was going on, but much like we told you guys in our much earlier Captain America history, uh, these were often penned by the same writers or up-and-coming writers uh, who were working at Marvel at the time, and they have these really unique stories, and if anything kind of picked up, they'd maybe turn it into a story later. So a lot of really neat stuff in these anthology books, but one really interesting thing about the time was that when people picked these up and they read them, they would start writing back to Marvel. You know I mean? A lot of us who are kind of my age, kind of the older crowd here, we remember writing those handwritten letters back to Marvel, hoping to get kind of in the back of the comics where they had the letters to the editor's section. Nowadays, there's a lot of email stuff and the you know website correspondence and all. But back in the day, you could buy a comic that had your name and your letter printed in it. 
and a response from either the writer or the artist or whoever you were writing to. So that was a very popular thing back here in the 60s. So it was often a driving force for who kind of got refeatured in a book. And Dr. Henry Pym and his wild adventure as kind of the incredible shrinking man who, you know, we can probably say may have been a bit of an influence on the story, uh, really got a lot of fan response. And they got a lot of letters of people talking about what a cool adventure that was because, uh, you know, I have a feeling it's a little bit more relatable than alien monsters stuck on a weird world, you know? So you read a story like this and you think, oh man, look, those are everyday things I see. Like this adventure could happen to me. So pretty cool stuff. And obviously that influx of letters and things like that made them say, hey, dude, let's do something with this. And Stan Lee is, you know, often said that Ant-Man's kind of been a personal favor to his. So it wasn't long before he was resurrected in superhero form in Tales to Astonish number 35. No easy feat, mind you, considering he destroyed his original potion. So I think it'd be pretty cool if we take a look back at how Tales to Astonish number 35 and Dr. Pym kind of came into being the first Ant-Man. But before we do that, isn't it a little bit interesting, the story I just kind of I just kind of laid out for you guys? It sort of sounds familiar, doesn't it? You know, it's funny because in the late 1980s, word got out that Disney was producing a story about shrinking. Right. So this is some years later. Right. And in a race to beat them to the punch, a number of other studios, once this word got leaked out. Started looking for their own shrinking story. Because in Hollywood, if you can kind of beat another studio to the punch, the general audience doesn't really know who came up with the idea first. So whoever gets it on screen first will usually get credit for kind of coming up with that idea or that genre. You, we saw a lot of that with the Armageddon, Deep Impact, Dante's Inferno, or Dante's Peak, the Volcano movie, I don't know. All those things, you know, we, we see those back and forth things like that where you're always like, man, who kind of really started this? And it's hard to tell unless you have those behind-the-scenes connections. So in this case, what's really interesting, someone got it in the ear of Stan Lee and the folks over at Marvel that they were looking for a shrinking story. So Stan Lee, like I said, being super excited about the Ant-Man tale, always being a fan of it, really tried to get a script together, get it optioned, and get it made. So can you imagine if we'd have had a late 80s kind of a la Batman 89 version of Ant-Man? Like, man, what, what would that would have been like? Huh? That would have been pretty crazy. So whatever happened with that, right? Well, let's see. That story I was telling you is kind of familiar. People getting shrunk by accident, right? Kind of killer insects coming after you and giving you a hard time. Befriending an ant and helping it get you home. Yeah, you guys can see where this is going. So in the late 1980s, the Disney movie that they were producing was none other than Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, which oddly enough seems to very much parallel that, you know, 1960s story that, uh, that they published in Tales to Astonish number 27. So, you know, there's a little bit of that, oh, hey, did they get influenced from The Incredible Shrinking Man and write the comic? But did this movie look at the comic and make a movie based on almost sort of the same thing, but add in some kids and some family-friendly fun? Take out all the horror elements? Who knows, guys? But it's a lot of fun when you look at all the parallels between these things. And you see just how much inspiration can be found in the smallest things and how far they can go in different directions. Because obviously by the time we got our Ant-Man movie today, it's very different than what we saw in that uh, original comic. It's very different than anything we saw in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. But it's all kind of in the same wheelhouse. So it's a lot of fun and just kind of an interesting fact I'd figure I'd throw out there for you guys. So anyways, let's get back to Tales to Astonish number 35. So this is where the Ant-Man actually starts, right? And he shows up, bam, right there on the cover, full costume. He's got his helmet. He's controlling ants. He's telling them, obey me, do my bid, and kick some butt, man. Everything that we know and love the Ant-Man about. Uh, four. Time and time again, I've said on this program as we dig up some history on different characters that I'm constantly surprised. And I think it's super cool that these comic book stories are translated so literally to screen, you know, and that so much of the tropes of what a character is are there right from the very beginning. 
You know, so here's another example of that from the costume to the helmet to the potion particles, whatever you want to call it, being what gives him his power, uh, being able to control and communicate with ants. It's all here right in this very first book. So let's delve into it. and Let's take a look at the story. What do you guys think? All right. So first up, we have the issue of him destroying his potion, right? Getting rid of it, saying, ah, this is too dangerous, almost killed myself, whatever. So kind of a pretty brilliant way of uh, writing this back in, dude. He's just like, you know what? That was a huge scientific achievement. I shouldn't let it go to waste. And he just makes it again. You know, I, he invented it. How hard would that be, right? <laughs> So in making his potion again, of course, it's a little bit different this time, as he'll find out throughout the course of the book. But he's actually kind of traumatized by his, you know, adventure with the ants there. You know, that harrowing experience really kind of left him with a little bit of a kind of phobia slash fascination with ants. As we can see here, he's kind of testing and measuring their strength. And he's like, oh, look at that, how, you know, the ant can lift 50 times his weight and everything. And I should take a minute here while we're talking about potions and the proportionate size of an ant to kind of, let's say, fair warning, none of the science in Ant-Man makes any sense, <laughs> okay? Dr. Pym's a famous, world-renowned scientist in his universe, but the, the information, the kind of technology that we had to study things like ants and shrinking at the time are vastly different than what we are today. And our base of knowledge on how these fundamental things work is very different. So as we go through this adventure, let's let's give Stan, Larry, Jack, let's give them a little bit of leeway on this one here because uh, they may not have had all the tools of the trade at the time. But anyways, getting back to the story here, he continues his research on ants, the biggest thing being how even at the time, uh, scientists didn't know how ants communicated. Uh, but the theory was that it was electronic impulses through their antenna. Um, nowadays, we know that it's actually through uh, phylactery senses. You know, they can smell and they emit different smells and different patterns and combinations that helps them communicate with each other. So kind of off base. But again, let's not get too much into the science. Let's just enjoy the science fiction, right? So Hank decides that he can probably develop some sort of device that would attenuate those electronic frequencies in a way that he'd be able to communicate with these ants. So kind of a really cool idea at the time. And since technology, transistors, and all this stuff was kind of big at the time, it's no doubt you know, the perfect route to go to kind of capture a science fiction young fan base, right? So, yeah, they give us kind of the quick retelling of his original story there and his kind of near-death experience with ants, which leads him to study these ants and everything. Um, but while he's kind of doing this research and all, it turns out that some Russian goons barge in and take him and his team hostage. And they want to steal some of his other research he's working on, particularly a potion that makes people immune to radiation. So again, let's not get too into the science here and just kind of have fun with the fact that it's a cool story. So, <laughs> so anyways, these Russian goons lock him up. And of course, they lock him up in the room where he has his uh, equipment that he's been building to communicate with the ants and where his potions and stuff are stored. And the team is kept outside and working. Um, so, you know, they don't want Pym interfering because he's like, I'll destroy it. Don't do anything. And then they tell the other people and they're like, no, you're going to do it or we're going to shoot you. And they're just like, dude, I just work here. Yes, I will totally do that. Now I did mention that Bill Foster was on Hank Pym's team, but at this time he was not. So let's not lump, you know, Bill Foster into kind of these origami fold under pressure team that Hank was working with here in the beginning. So, Jason L., you're right, dude. It's always the Russians, man. You know? <laughs> they, they always show up either to mess up your Indiana Jones movie or, you know, to get you into all sorts of commie shenanigans back in the 60s, man. <laughs> all right. So, um, remembering his stored potion, uh, Pym takes it 
and he starts to use everyday objects, which I think, again, is so cool and what really got the reader's attention. He starts using these everyday objects to help him thwart these bad guys, right? So he's using a rubber band here to kind of propel himself out uh, up to a window ledge, right? And he's gathered up this uh, string, like normal thread you'd sew a button with. And he's gathered it up, and he's using it as a rope to get down to the outside. And he's like, man, I got to get out of here and go find some help, right? So really cool stuff. But he also notices that, like I mentioned, his potion didn't work quite the same this time. And it turns out he has two new powers that he didn't have before. First off, uh, well, here's the thread thing. The thread thing. I didn't think I had a photo of that. I did. <laughs> All right. But, oh, he goes, oh, look at this, an anthill nearby. Lucky. So first off, he realizes he has kept his proportionate strength as a man. So he can totally, like, kick the crap out of these ants where, you know, last time he was all, oh, getting caught up by them and he was getting beat up by the ants. This time he's like, uh uh, -uh dude, Whoop. and he just gorilla presses this dude just a million miles away. Ain't hey, nobody's business. I ain't worried about it, right? Now, the second power doesn't really come from the serum itself, but from his brand new helmet that he's built. So uh, he uses it to conjure up an army of ants, right? So now that he can communicate with them, you know, it's got some really great touch-and-go panels, I just want to mention, right, where he's kind of trying to talk to the ants, and they're not really... So it's not like he just walked in there and was like, dude, I got it, and then the ants do whatever he wants. It was very reminiscent to what we saw in the film, where Scott Lang was having a very hard time kind of communicating with ants right from the get-go. You know, it was very difficult. So it was cool to see at least a couple of panels where they acknowledge that this being the first time he's going to use this technology, it didn't just go off without a hitch. Some of the ants were a little weird. He had to mess with the frequency thing a bit. And then before you know it, bam, he can kind of talk to the, uh, to the ants and get them to kind of do what he wants. So it's pretty cool. And he decides, hey, if I've got an army of ants, maybe I don't need to run and get help from anybody and take a million years before I ever get back here because I'm this big. Maybe I can go back and do something about it. So he starts making his way back, and he gets attacked by a giant beetle, right? Now, this is just a small part of the story. Uh, you know, obviously, he tricks it, gets it thrown into a thing here. He buries it, and, uh, you know, it'll dig its way out. It's fine. But I just wanted to put this in here kind of, again, as a callback to that Honey, I Shrunk the Kids thing where they had the scorpion that was fighting the ant, and now here he's fighting some other random bug that he's like, no, I'm the ant man, the hell with this beetle thing. You know, so kind of the same thing. Like I said, who's really borrowing from who? Where's all this inspiration coming from? It's just cool to see kind of the same ideas. You know, maybe it's a, a whole Marconi situation. Maybe these guys both invented the wheel on their own. You know, I'm not going to say they didn't, but it's interesting. <laughs> all right, but he does manage to sneak back inside the building with his army of ants and with his newfound strength that he realized he has, he starts untying his staff. And telling him, like, all right, well, he can't tell him anything because he's too tiny. But he's pulling it off hoping that they'll overthrow these, you know, Russian goons and kind of, you know, get, gain their freedom, save the day kind of a thing. But, of course, you know, the Russian goons have gun and, guns and stuff, which is why they got, you know, tied up in the first place. Uh, but Ant-Man's one step ahead, and he uses his ants to crawl up and all over the, uh, the bad Russian dudes there bite him like crazy and kind of catch him off guard and make the guy drop his gun. And then the team can kind of thwart these guys and they beat him up. And there's a nice kind of hoorah moment at the end where they're like, ha ha, those Russian guys were nothing. You know, once they didn't have the guns, then we got them. So, you know, <laughs> that's kind of nice. Uh, glad they finally did something. But with that, the legend of the Ant-Man is born, man, you know, and no one knows who the Ant-Man is. They don't realize that that's why they got untied. They think they just shambled free. So he sneaks off back into his office. They open the door. They find him there all in his rack in his regular clothes. And they're like, oh, Hank, we saved the day. Everything's great. And he's like, cool, man. And he kind of, you know, trails off into the sunset there going, boy, I wonder if I'll ever have to be the Ant-Man again. And I love the little, the little note at the bottom here, the caption, that's just like, yeah, dude, you totally will in, like, the next issue. So <laughs> that's good stuff. They didn't leave readers hanging back then, man. So so that's fun. But that's basically everything you need to know about Hank Pym, 
the original Ant-Man, guys. So let me know in the comments what you think about that cool story, man. You can, guys, you can get your hands on these books out there. They've got some great reprints of them. They've got online versions of them you can read. Some websites are a little fugazi about it. Some websites are pretty cool about it. Um, but definitely try to give credit where it's due, you know, money where it's due for these awesome books and these classic tales. Uh, but like I said, that's pretty much Hank Pym in a nutshell. I mean, you know, except for, of course, the Wasp and stuff. We got we to gotta talk about the Wasp a little bit. So, you know, it's a couple of issues later, right? And let me, let me just check my notes here. All right, it's Tales to Astonish, number 44, where after Hank meets up with the daughter of a murdered scientist named Vernon Van Dyne, Right, that he has this crazy adventure with this crazy gal right here. So this is Janet Van Dyne, the first time he meets her there. Her father's still alive here, but he ends up getting murdered, right? And during the issue, right, which isn't long after, I mean, this is only nine issues later, he's talking to Janet and telling her, like, oh, man, I feel so bad for you. You remind me of my first wife, Maria. So, bam, he had a whole other wife, a whole other life before he met Janet. But he's telling her, like, yeah, I feel bad. Uh, your father got, like, murdered here, and this is terrible. Like, we're going to do something about it. And they kind of confide in each other, and he realizes her commitment to kind of seeking justice for him and all. And Hank decides that he's going to give her the potion so that she can shrink and grow and stuff like that. Um, and he's also going to, you know splice her full of experimental cells that he created that will kind of give her her own uh, natural antenna inside of her head that she can use to communicate with insects and she'll also kind of like grow wings. So yeah, there's that, you know, you meet a nice girl, pump her full of experimental cells, give her crazy superpowers and give her your crazy shrink potion. I mean, who hasn't been there, right? So... <laughs> So, you know, it's kind of a weird origin story for the Wasp, a little bit different than kind of the more, I hate to say grounded, but somewhat more realistic story that we got with Ant-Man. But either way, Janet's a really cool character. She's great. Uh, a little tropey for 60s women in the sense that she kind of throws herself at Hank and is like, oh, you know, you're so great. I love you so much. And he's kind of like, no, dude, like you're a flighty socialite girl and Apparently dating girls that like you wasn't a big thing in the 60s because like all these superheroes do that. I don't know. Like Daredevil never wants to get it with Karen. Tony never wants to bang Pepper. I don't know what's going on in the 60s, man, but it, that is not at all what I've heard about the 60s. I thought the 60s was all willy-nilly. Everybody was dating everybody. But, you know, this was very early in the 60s. Maybe that hadn't come around yet. I don't know. So anyways, she ends up getting kind of more and more of a strong personality as the comics progress, which is great. And obviously the character uh, that we see on film is Hope, right? That's who Evangeline Lilly plays. She plays Hope Pym, who is their daughter, right? Now, in the original comics, and in pretty much the whole legacy of comics to this day, there isn't really a Hope Pym. There's an alternate reality version of kind of Ant-Man stories where there is a Hope but she's not in kind of the 616 current continuity of the Marvel Universe. So that's kind of an interesting twist. Uh, but Janet's definitely is featured in the MCU films. Of course, we hear about her getting stuck and sucked into the quantum realm, like I said. is uh, You know, Michelle Pfeiffer's character is uh, presumably her in the new Ant-Man and the Wasp film. So looking forward to hearing about that and seeing how that story kind of changes because there's a, bit, there's a bit of a weird history between these two. Because like I said, how do you start off with this kind of young girl whose father's murdered and then she gets experimental cells pumped in her and she kind of digs this guy, but he doesn't really like her back. And then they end up being married and having kids and having this, you know, awesome join the Avengers, all this stuff, you know, like this, this has got to be kind of a wild ride, right? So let's see, let's take a look at kind of what's going on with this story here. Okay. So first things first, right? They want to track down her father's murderer, who is the Cosmonian alien creature that we see here. So, yeah, you know, you meet a nice girl, 
You find out her father was murdered by an alien. You pump her full of experimental... Who hasn't been there? Am I right? I mean, these are just the things that happen to people in their life. So, you know, they go and they avenge kind of, uh, you know, her father there. So that's that's all well and good. And it kind of seems like Janet might just have avenge on the mind as they kind of go on through the rest of their uh, adventures and end up in... The Avengers, man. So like I said, Janet's kind of the one who comes up with the name The Avengers. And it's not shortly after. We're only talking maybe six or seven years at most in between that story and this story here. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot really going on kind of in Janet's head. And a lot, of, a lot of weird stuff kind of floating around the Marvel Universe there. But the two characters, Ant-Man and the Wasp, do join the Avengers in their very first adventure, right? We've mentioned before on some of our previous Countdown to Infinity War videos that the Avengers film definitely parallels this initial book a super ton in the fact that Loki's kind of the main villain. His whole plan is to kind of get the Hulk to fight the Avengers. There's sort of this sort of subtext about taking away something that Thor loves and making him fight. And the comic book version's a little bit different in the fact that there was no setup for the Avengers ahead of time. Like, literally, Loki was trying to get Thor to fight the Hulk uh, in a sort of Asgardian plan thing we don't need to get into. But he was basically trying to trick Thor into some stuff. Uh, but when the word got out that the Hulk was on a rampage, unbeknownst to Loki, he kind of put it out there where all of these other heroes could find it. So, of course, Tony Stark found it. And Ant-Man's cool helmet that's attenuated to all sorts of different, you know, electronic frequencies, bam, picks it right up. So he tells the Wasp, hey, man, the Hulk's on the loose. We should go and help out. I mean, what if we shrank the Hulk into nothing? Boom. How much damage could he do? So there you go. They're off on an adventure to kind of go and try to help things out, right? And like I said, during the course of that ad adventure... They managed to use the ants and stuff to catch Loki off guard. I mean, obviously, that's not something they dealt with on Asgard, right? They got ants in your pants, man. No, <laughs> you don't do that. But here on Earth, it's something that kind of happens. So it really caught Loki off guard and kind of helped them thwart him at the end of the book. At which point, they're all kind of celebrating and cheering. And they talk about, hey, we need a name for the kind of cool super team that we've put together. And Janet's the one who says, it should be something colorful and dramatic like the avengers or and hank's like or nothing baby the avengers is it i love it i think it's great and that's the name that they stuck with forever you know because it was on the title of the book anyways but it's cool that janet kind of got that plug and again does this have something to do with her kind of having that avenge origin i don't know but it is kind of interesting to think how well would that have fit into the feature film of the avengers because in the end of the film, Coulson dying was pretty much the death that they were avenging. You know, it kind of seems like they could have really easily moved some things around in that story to make it maybe Janet's father or something like that, who they're trying to avenge. Now, again, that's just kind of wild thinking and frontier thinking in the sort of a fun realm of what if. But hey, a lot of what if stuff was what Marvel was all known for, right? So there you go. Uh, something to think about, something to consider, something that was a lot of fun. Uh, Steve, Big Steve, thanks, man. I'm glad you're having a good time and learning a lot about Ant-Man and the Wasp. I know you said you weren't a super fan of the character, so maybe tonight you're hearing a little something neat that might spark some interest. I know these older stories are very different than a lot of the newer stories, but right now, after this inception of the Avengers and everything kind of coming to be there, Boy, is the Ant-Man about to go on a ride, man. So let's dive right into it, man. We're going to be playing our Quantum Realm survival game here as soon as this segment's over, guys. So stick with me. We got a little bit more cool Ant-Man history to go through, and then we're going to jump into this awesome, fun game. So all right. So we got the Avengers now. Ant-Man and the Wasp are there. They're actually hanging out in two books in Tales to Astonish and in the uh, Avengers uh, for a little while, and then they end up leaving uh, Tales to Astonish, and someone else takes over that book, and then they are kind of mostly in the Avengers, but they're not featured in every issue. They kind of wish-wash in and out, you know. Um, other characters like Thor and Iron Man and Captain America returning kind of steal more of the limelight, and they kind of get a little bit pushed aside for a little while. 
So it's, you know, kind of one of those things where Ant-Man was never the coolest, the bestest, the neatest hero because compared to a god and an unkillable Hulk machine and a guy with a super suit, it's a little hard to say like, well, I, c I can be this big, dude, and that's super important and people need that. And plus, dude, like my girlfriend's totally here. You know, like you end up being the guy that's uh, kind of not everyone's favorite guy. So his popularity kind of waned in comics a little bit and he started not being featured as much, right? So it didn't take long before they realized if they started stacking him up against the Avengers and stuff like this or, or, or Avengers level villains, he would need to add a little bit to his repertoire, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, the Avengers film. Would have been cool to see them in there. See them down there. Bam, right there. <laughs> All right. So talk about the Ant-Man. Bam. Tales do astonish, number 49. They came up with the idea to make him giant man. If he could make a potion that makes him shrink, why can't he make a potion that make, makes himself really big, dude? It only made sense. It was one of the best things about Civil War when that film came out. Uh, Scott Lang's ability to grow super huge. Uh, like we said, Goliath and these other characters all use Hank Pym stuff to kind of grow and be larger than life, man. And that kind of stuff. Now that looks awesome on the big screen, man. Now everything they did in the first Ant-Man movie with him shrinking was really well done. Really cool stuff. I really liked the perspectives weren't always from his point of view, right? They did a lot of stuff where you were as large as the world looking at little itty bitty Ant-Man. You know, so they had a lot of fun play with that. They're very smart and to kind of make you feel like you were in Ant-Man's world and that you were still in our world and that you could share time in each. So it was a lot of fun. But when we got to Civil War and we finally got to share some time in Giant Man's world, I mean, that was another level. That was exciting. That's when you felt like, hey, man, it was cool to see him in Tony Stark's suit jumping around in there, screwing up wires and all. And you're like, that's all well and good. But, dude, when he grabs War Machine straight out the sky, you're like, all right, that, that, that giant man, that's a dude you don't mess with right there, you know? So that was a super ton of fun. I got to say, on a side note, uh, the Eraser, this villain here, seems like a pretty sinister villain. You know, I don't know why I hadn't heard of this guy since. Um, but he definitely kind of seems like he's erasing you right out of your own comic. So is this guy like a Deadpool like villain now? <laughs> you know, because he knows you're in a comic. I don't know, man. But he seems pretty cool. I, I might just do one of these on the Eraser someday, and we'll find out where he's at. But obviously, we can see the Wasp is already hanging out with him there. So she's been around for about five issues, and uh, you know he takes up this mantle of Giant Man. And then soon after, uh, adventures are going crazy in the Avengers with him as giant man but bam a short while later after his popularity kind of waned like i said he comes back right as giant man in the avengers but with a different outfit with a different attitude and he calls himself goliath right so hank pym is actually the first goliath as well right bill foster will take up that mantle and that uniform later on but in the very original inception of him here in the Avengers number 28, it is Hank Pym who first suits up as Goliath, man. So this is when he kind of makes a big debut in the Avengers to kind of kick some butt and really be a giant, like, you know, almost mean-spirited version of Ant-Man where he's just out here, you know, boots to asses getting the job done, you know? So that's kind of a lot of fun. But again, we're starting to see how he's going through these iterations, you know, like Hank Pym maybe doesn't seem like the most stable guy out here. He seems like he can't decide on a costume. He can't decide on a power like things are a little weird for this guy. So hopefully everything will kind of work out for him here uh, as he kind of finds his footing in the Avengers now as Goliath. So here he's kind of reverted back to his giant man state in issue number 59. So sometime later, about 30, uh, 31 issues later. Um, but he is apparently thwarted by Yellow Jacket. Now, I showed you guys a photo of the MCU photo uh, Yellow Jacket earlier, who was Darren Cross in the film, right? But this, this Yellow Jacket, man, it, dude, look, he took out Giant Man. 
what's going on? Who is this bad dude who just showed up wrecking shop, right? Well, things aren't looking good for Giant Man if he's getting dropped like that. And it turns out that sure enough, man, in the very next issue, issue number 60, where Hank, or I'm sorry, where Janet ends up getting married to Yellow Jacket, everyone's losing their marbles. They're like, what the heck is going on? Captain America's like, dude, I got to get down there and stop this. Nobody heard of this guy, Yellow Jacket, until yesterday. So we're like, we don't know what's up. Plus, he's saying he killed Giant Man, that he killed Hank Pym. So everyone's like, nah, dude, that's not going to fly. Janet can't just marry this joker. We don't know who the heck he is. And he's claiming that he killed Giant Man, right? Now, that cover that we just saw of Giant Man and, you know, Yellow Jacket standing on top of him, a little deceptive, right? When you actually read the book, he just says that happened, right? So that's an illustration of something that Yellow Jacket says he did. So everyone's kind of in issue 60. They're like, dude, we don't believe this guy. We think Hank's around. And when he finds out you're marrying his girl, he's going to stomp a hole through you. You know. So lo and behold, it's very interesting when it turns out that Yellow Jacket is none other than Hank Pym himself, having totally had a mental breakdown, wanting to kill off his own previous characters, his own previous iterations and say that now he's this new even more badass yellow jacket guy he's still gonna marry the girl that he loves and he doesn't care and janet kind of knows what's going on and is kind of figuring it out and she's kind of like well i love this guy so i'm just gonna roll with it and i gotta say it's kind of rough for janet to kind of be in that situation you know, but I appreciate you being supportive of your partner, of the people you care about and stuff. But I know there's got to be a lot of people out there who's thinking about Janet in the MCU disappearing into the quantum realm and just gone for 30 years or so now. So, hey, maybe this isn't the worst thing in the world, you know, being like, OK, so Hank got a little nutty for a bit, but let's just let him be this yellow jacket guy. Calm the hell down and you know, we'll all tell him he's a badass and everything's fine. And we won't have to worry about it. You know, it'll be fine. Um, so maybe not so bad for Janet to, you know, better to live here than stuck in the quantum realm, you know. So, you know, she ends up marrying, you know, Hank, Yellow Jacket. Everyone's kind of cool with it once they realize it's Hank. Uh, they're kind of, uh, okay, you know, whatever he wants to do is fine. Uh, but, you know, it's working out good for Janet. You got to think, hey, cool. You still married the guy you loved. Let's help him kind of get his noggin together, and we'll move on from there. So everything's looking good for Janet, of course, until Yellow Jacket just starts beating her. So Hank has totally lost his mind. Now he's turned into a, a poster child for domestic violence, man, and things are not looking good because that is certainly not super cool, and I would absolutely rather be qu caught in the quantum realm than beaten by your spouse. I mean, that's horrible, you know? So it doesn't get any better for poor Janet when he decides to sick giant killer robots on her that he specifically programmed to defend against her uh, stinging abilities and her little sting lasers and her ability to shrink, and they're made out of adamantium. So he's really going all out with this whole killer robot thing, and he's trying to tell her, no, the whole point is that I'm going to build this killer robot and I'm going to send it out to battle the Avengers. And then once he's battling the Avengers and they're getting the crap kicked out of him, I'm going to jump in and beat the robot down. And then the Avengers are going to be like, dude, you're the best Avenger because I should be the best Avenger. Now, of course, Janet thinks this is just the most dumbass idea she's ever heard. She's not on board with it at all. She gets the robot sicked on her and things are just not looking good. Luckily, she makes it out of there okay. But Hank continues this bizarre quest to keep building these killer robots and stuff in this like ever continuing quest to make amends for that original robot he built and set against the Avengers. Right? We're talking about Ultron. So in the original comic book history, it was Hank Pym who created the Ultron character, the Ultron robot, who gained its kind of AI sentience way back in issue, I believe it's 55 of the Avengers. He's first introduced, uh, well, okay, he's kind of introduced in 54, but he's named in 55. 
right? So they actually call him Ultron in 55. He's kind of just around as like a helper dude in 54. Um, but this story, written by Roy Thomas and drawn by John Buscema, right, uh, ends up being what we know as the Ultron robot today. You know, uh, the kind of crazy, have a just... Like a robot Hitler, man. He has a hard-on for murder and genocide and all this stuff. He thinks he's the next evolution of life and needs to just destroy all of mankind. He has a personal super beef and vendetta against Hank Pym. And he kind of seems like he has the hots for Janet. So maybe kind of an uh, you know, Oedipal thing? I don't know. Um, so a lot of weird stuff kind of going on with Ultron, but we definitely know he's a bad dude. I mean, in comics today, he's considered the most threatening piece of technology in the MCU. I mean, he just wrecked shop. He had himself uh, refitted in adamantine. He hooked up to the internet. He's part of nanotechnology like Tony Stark's suit. He ends up taking over Tony Stark's body with the nanotech at one point. I mean, Ultron is just a seriously bad dude who never seems to go away. And that stain on Hank Pym becomes a driving force for him to kind of be this best Avenger. You know, this kind of ideal that he can never achieve because it seems like he works so hard at it that he's shooting himself in the foot, you know, and he drives himself crazy and he ends up doing stupid shit like hitting his wife, you know. So and now no one's you're not anyone's favorite Avenger if you're hitting your wife, man. So obviously there are some colossal differences between comic book version of Hank Pym and film version of Hank Pym. But how much of those will come together? We'll definitely find out with the return of Janet because I think there's still some leeway to explore a lot of those story elements with Janet back in the fold that she can kind of tell more of their history together. And obviously Hank wouldn't just well, tell everybody that all the time. So it's no wonder he hasn't mentioned anything like that in the films. So it's also still a pretty scumbag thing and you don't want any hero doing that. So while it's cool to see kind of the Tony Stark demon in the bottle route of, you know, characters with flaws, uh, kind of turning to spousal abuse is pretty rugged, man. So we'll see what happens. We'll see if there's some way he can make amends for it, if he can make things right, or if he will be the one getting avenged on, you know? Will she show back up and kick the crap out of him for pulling some shenanigans, or will Marvel completely ignore it? I don't know, man. We'll have to see this weekend when the MCU finally catches up. But we do know that the MCU version of Ultron is very different than the comic book version of Ultron. Uh, but both iterations are very successful. I think they work very well. Um, Hank Pym also creates the Vision, who is kind of created by Tony Stark again and Ultron later. Um, so the MCU counterparts here are definitely very similar. And I love the fact that they use the source material so well, you know. And, yeah, they do change some of the names, and dates, and places. But with Hank Pym not really being part of the MCU at the time, I think it was a good decision to kind of use Stark's tech, which still seems way more advanced than anybody else's, and to keep Hank's more in the realm of shrinking and growing things and kind of uh, spatial differences between atoms, which I have a feeling is where Ghost and her abilities is going to come into play with a lot of their tech and what they're doing. So fun stuff all the way around, man. And I can't wait to check out the movie this weekend. I hope that that kind of gets your guys' juices flowing for checking out Ant-Man and the Wasp this weekend. There is some super, super fun stuff going down in the trailers for these movies, man. Like I said, all those great characters we saw will be returning. We've got a whole cadre of new characters who are going to add to the mythos. It does take place before Infinity War, so if you're totally bummed out by any of that, it may be nice to see a movie that's not part of that, although it may lead into that at the end, which may leave you on a bummer again. So who knows? We'll all have to wait and see on that one. But for the time being, I can tell you guys this. The sordid comic book history of Hank Pym has been told and retold time and time again. And it's great that we have the second iteration of Ant-Man who shows up many years later actually premiering in an Avengers book as an electronic technician who works for Tony Stark and, you know, takes up the mantle as Scott Lang and steals the Ant-Man suit very much like he does in the feature film. And, 
you know, starts to commit crime with it because he is trying to um, pay for an operation for his daughter Cassie. Now, the operation part we don't see in the feature film, but the rest of that story is very similar to what we saw kind of in the original comics. So a lot of fun stuff there, man. More stuff than we can get into tonight. I wanted to give you guys some history on the Ant-Man, but like I said, there was so much amazing history surrounding just Henry Pym and Janet Van Dyne themselves that I kind of focused on mostly them tonight since we may get a lot more of their story coming up in the movie this weekend and since Scott's story very much kind of parallels his story in the comics. So Without any further ado, that's going to conclude our awesome history session on the Ant-Man. Like I said, I hope you guys are psyched for checking out Ant-Man and the Wasp this weekend. But right now, I see Jason Y just joined us, man, and you're just in time because we are going to start our Quantum Realm survival game. All right, so all you crazy cats still hanging out with me tonight, I super appreciate it. I'm glad to see you guys out there. And we have got some great, great, great prizes that are courtesy of Big Dog Comics and Thunderdome Gaming up there in Fort Pierce. Captain Joel up there, the big dog, roo, roo, roo. He sent us down some amazing, amazing stuff. I know we got some Tumblr glasses here that I believe are Stark Industry glasses. We've got some more signature hero clicks that are like pr promo hero clicks. I believe it's a Rocket Raccoon. And... I know we've got an Ant-Man prize that is a very high-ticket Ant-Man prize, and I believe it's a piece of paraphernalia that you actually wear on your person, but I'm not 100%. I didn't get a chance to look at it before I came on air tonight, but I will tell you this. It's dope, right? It's super good, and you guys are going to love it. So we're going to give them out uh, tonight here. Whoever gets an answer right can pick whatever prize they want. That's fine. And once all three of them are gone... We're going to wrap it up for tonight. But until then, here's what we got going on. We have got the Quantum Realm survival game. So what I've done here is I've got a collection of photographs that are taken super macro, super up close of the, the general everyday average world around you, right? And you'll see that super, super close up picture. And I'll give you guys about 30 seconds to figure out what this object is. So throw it down in the comments. Let me know what you think it is. The first person to get it right, like I said, will get to choose one of the three prizes that we've got to give out tonight, man. So like I said, we've got a rac Rocket Raccoon Hero Clicks. We've got some tumbler glasses from Stark Industries. And we've got some unnamed Ant-Man paraphernalia. So it's up to you which of the three you'd like. And we're going to keep going until we get three of these right because they're super tough. So like I said, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds from right now to go ahead and tell me what is this I'll tell you what I think I think I've got this tonight where we could use a little bit of pin particles and make it kind of big let's check it out bam all right so what do you guys think of that what could it be oh man Steve Z I think you just snuck in there baby I think you just did but both you guys are right onto it it's a hundred percent a toothbrush all right, Steve Z, you get to name your prize right there. But until then, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next picture. Um, Steve, I don't think you're eligible to win another prize. Three different people have to win it. So <laughs> Let's see what's up. Maybe, maybe I'll let you win two prizes. We'll, we'll see. If you get one that nobody gets after the 30 seconds, I'll be fine. <laughs> All right, so next up, we got another macro picture here. Let's see if you can survive in the quantum realm. Do you know what this is? Oh, this one's weird. Kind of a kind of a callback there to that uh, that film we were talking about earlier. That's so paralleled the Ant Man stories. We'll check it out on the big screen. Oh man, what do you think, guys? What do you think? Oh, Eric G., I see you out there, buddy. Thank you for tuning in. We're, we're right now, we're playing our Quantum Realm survival game. So take a look at this photo that's macro super up close and tell us what you think it is. 
I'll give you guys about 10 more seconds. Let's see some comments. What is it? Oh, be, be, be a little more specific, Big Steve. You be a little more specific. I'll, 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 I'll go ahead and give you a second prize. <laughs> oh, Jason Y, baby, came in with it. He's talking about that Oreo. Now, this may, in fact, be a Hydrox cookie. I don't know. <laughs> But no, I'm pretty sure it's the Oreo, brother. So good job there. You got yourself a prize. Make sure to comment what you want. Big Steve, you got a comment. Well, send me a, a PM, whatever you want to do. Let the power hour know. Well, no, put it in the comments because then the, you know they know what's left. So you got a Rocket Raccoon Hero Clicks. You got a Tony Stark Tumbler Glass, which is pretty cool. You want the glasses? I see it down there. Cups. All right. So the, the Stark Industries Tumbler Glasses, they're pretty dope, man. They're your, they might not be tumblers. They might be pint glasses. I don't have them in front of me, and I don't remember now. I looked at them like three days ago. <laughs> but they're super cool. I remember that. All right. So Jason Y, Eric G, if you guys are still out there, you got a chance to win either a Rocket Raccoon Hero Clicks. That's a promo figure. It's worth some money. Right, or you can get your hands on some Ant Man and the Wasp paraphernalia. You wear it. I'm pretty sure you wear it, and it's super cool. It's not. I don't think it's a T-shirt. I think it's worth more than a T-shirt. So I'm not 100 what it is, but I remember looking at it and being like, "Damn, that's super expensive and super cool." So let's go ahead and move on to the next image here. Again, this is our Quantum Realm survival game. I'm gonna show you this super close-up image. See if you can tell me what this is. What is this here? Oh, if you were a teeny tiny man, perhaps the size of an ant man, would you be able to tell what this is? All right, Jason Y. He's doing the pin prize, baby. You got it. Ooh, Steve Z's calling a pencil. Let's take a peek here back in studio and let's see what it is. We got a pencil. That's what's up, man. Big Steve, you're killing it out there, man. We're just gonna have to. We're, we're just gonna have to give you that rocket raccoon, man. If no one else is gonna freaking chime in here, you know, we're. we're I know we got more people out there. They're just not commenting, you know. Maybe they're a little too afraid. Their, their thumbs ain't fast enough. How about I throw one more out there, Big Steve? We'll throw one more, and if they could smoke you on this one, then they could have it, right? How's that sound? All right. Let's see what we got here. Oh, this is an easy one. Come on, this one's easy, guys. Somebody throw this one down there. You're going to get a prize right now. You're going to get a Rocket Raccoon Hero Click. Here it is on the big. All right, so if you were in the quantum realm and you snuck up and took a peek of this object, bam, oh, bam, paperclip Eric G, man. He 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 tagged in there just behind Steve Z. What do, what do you think, man? What do you, what, what do you think? We Yeah, we're going to hook Eric G up with the Rocket Raccoon Hero Click, baby. We're going to hook you up right there, man. Big Steve says it's all right, even though he guessed a whole bunch of them. But we we know how it is, man. Sometimes it's hard to get, to get the little keyboards out in time, you know? Big Steve's a good guy out there, man. So we know he's won a lot of awesome stuff here at the Power Hour Love. So... He's, he's more than happy to hook you up, Eric G, with your promo figure of Rocket Raccoon. It's super cool, man. We gave away the Juggernaut one just a couple weeks ago. We just mailed it out up there to, uh, I believe, Brando, uh, the amazing Brando uh, out there, and, uh, and that's, that's headed his way. Um, but you guys want to do another one for fun? Let's do another one for fun, man. We got no more prizes to give away. Thank you guys so much for joining me tonight and hanging out to the very last minute and checking out the Quantum Realm survival game. But let's see what's up in the final couple of slides here, because I think I got a couple more. Ooh, what about this one? This one's just pretty, right? Got a little bit of blue in there. Kind of matches my shirt a little bit. I like that. Here it is on the big, guys. Almost looks like an eyeball on the end there, huh? What could it be? Oh, man. Has that one got you guys stumped out there? Oh, Eric G got that one, man. He was wasted no time with the ink pen. Absolutely, bud. We're talking. Look, look at that. I can't think of the name of these. It's a type of Bic pen. It's really fan. These ones that leak everywhere, man. They're kind of a big pain in the ass, but they're really nice to write with. 
But if you leave them, man, they're just poof, everywhere. But super nice pen there. I think we got. I think we got one more. I think we got one more, and I think it's a hard one. I think it's a really hard one. Let's check it out, guys, just for fun, and we'll go ahead and wrap it up here tonight. Oh, no, that's it. That's the last one. Oh, you dashed my hopes expertly, sir. So, <laughs> there you go, guys. We got Big Steve. We got Jason Y. We got Eric G. All getting some prizes courtesy of Big Dog Comics and Thunderdome Gaming up there in Fort Pierce, man. Go by. Tell Captain Joel you said hi. Tell him the Power Hour sent you, baby, and he will hook you up with some of the awesome and hottest games, comics, comic paraphernalia. He's got all sorts of T-shirts, classic stuff, man, out there. That's super fun and super cool stuff that we're trying to bum off him all the time to give away here on the Power Hour, man. But he's a super good guy. He's super nice. He'll be happy to see you. He'll be happy to know that the Power Hour sent you guys. I'm happy to know that you guys stuck around and hung out with me tonight. Like I said, we're going to try to find uh, Senior Bull there. He got shrunk down a little bit earlier. You can catch that at the beginning of this video. But, uh, you know, he he got hit with some of the effects of uh, of, of, of Ant-Man's uh, gadgets there. He got got juiced with some PIM particles. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, th I think I'll be able to track him down before the cleaning crew gets here. But otherwise, I better start searching with my magnifying glass right now. Thank you guys so much for joining me. Have a fantastic night. Catch up with us next week. I believe we've got the Horror Mafia joining us for some Friday the 13th action that's going to be happening next Friday. And we're going to be having all sorts of fun uh, next month. Monday talking about Friday the 13th and uh, the whole mythos that falls behind that. So hopefully we'll see you guys there. Otherwise, this is El Bandito signing off for tonight, letting you guys know to keep it real, have fun, and I hope you guys check out Ant-Man and the Wasp this weekend. Peace! <laughs>